Uh, thank you very much, Maury. And uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land we gather and pay my respects to elders past and present. It's always good to get an introduction uh, from Maury. Uh, before, as we know, he took up this very important role. He was doing a very important role in the electorate of Kira, and that was as the uh, principal of Kira High School. So uh, both are very important, but uh, biasly, I, I, I'd like him back there soon one day. So, uh, look, I'd like to thank Maury and the officers at the New South Wales Teachers Federation for the invitation to join you here today. I'd like to start my address by giving you a little bit of background about who I am and the journey I've taken to become the New South Wales Shadow Minister for Education. 19 years ago, I graduated from a great public school, Dapto High, having received a world... <laughs> having received a world-class education from some of the finest educators I've ever come across. Teachers like Rosemary Davis, who went on to play a pivotal role in the now abolished curriculum directorate. The highly respected Alan McKay, who mentored my love and interest in the spoken and written word. And the late Stephen Moorhead, who as my year advisor for six years, inspired a little skinny kid to believe in himself and to follow his dreams. And my dream was to teach. After graduating with honours in education from the University of Wollongong, I was fortunate enough to spend a number of years teaching at another fine, comprehensive public high school, Lake Illawarra where I got a first-hand understanding about the power of education to make a positive change in the lives of those from disadvantaged backgrounds. Whilst teaching, I undertook my Masters in Educational Leadership under the leadership of former Deputy Director General Terry Burke and then spent some time as a curriculum consultant in road safety and PDHPE. During this time, I was a proud member of the New South Wales Teachers Federation. I then had the opportunity to work for a government minister for a number of years before taking up an executive role in the Department of Transport and then winning the seat of Kira in 2011. And there weren't many of us who did that. 12 months ago, John Robertson gave me an opportunity that I have cherished to be the New South Wales Shadow Education Minister. There's only one better job and that's to be the Education Minister. A role that has allowed me to pursue my passion for education policy. Council, the first task I undertook as the Shadow Minister was not to criticise the government or to roll out some horror statistic. It was to write to the Minister and congratulate him on supporting the finest educational blueprint this country has ever seen, the Gonski reforms, and to request that we join together and make a formal delegation to Canberra to put pressure on Christopher Pine to honour the deal. No one is more proud than I to belong to the Australian Labor Party, the party who pledged to transform the way we funded schools from an outdated, ad hoc and discredited way to one that was focused on the needs of students and supported those who needed it most. But Council, Gonski was never a four-year program. You and I know that the big gains came in those fifth and sixth years of funding. I'm disappointed that this funding, that had bipartisan support going into the last federal election, has not been agreed to. This disappointment is not just because I'm the Shadow Minister, but because I'm a dad and a former classroom school teacher. And I know just how much of a difference this needs-based funding approach would make to the lives of so many children right across New South Wales. Council, Council Gonski did not simply come about because of a politician in Canberra or Sydney thought it was a good idea. The women and men in this room and thousands of others right across New South Wales and this country made it a mainstream issue. Through your road shows, your billboards, your social media, your public rallies and forums, ensured that parents and community members knew what was at stake. You gave up your time, you gave your energy to ensure this campaign 
became one that politicians from all sides couldn't ignore. And I will never forget that. And that's why if I become the Minister for Education, I will make it my priority to get the full funding program back on the COAG agenda. I want it back at ministerial council meetings and I want it back on track for the benefit of young people, regardless of who occupies the Treasury benches in Canberra. Council. <clears throat> Council, my father was a fitter and turner, who for over 20 years was an apprentice trainer at engineering firms right across the Illawarra. He trained young people for work skills competitions and was frequently called on by our local TAFE to provide advice, support and knowledge to the tradespeople of tomorrow. Just last week, my dad talked to me about the opportunities that TAFE had provided and reminisced as we discussed what this government was doing to TAFE, about how these opportunities will not be available for my sons should they wish to pursue a career in one of the trades if this path continues. We are seeing TAFE ripped apart. We are seeing courses cut and hours slashed. We are seeing teachers sacked and enrolments plummet. And council, we are seeing fees rise by thousands of dollars, pricing so many people out of an opportunity to gain an education or be re-qualified to enter the labour market. And for what? There's not a skerrick of evidence that the race to privatise our TAFE system will be good for anyone. Even the Business Council of Australia said recently, and I quote, what we don't want is a market where the public providers are left with residual element that private providers don't want to operate in, end quote. Council, you know more than most that ed education is not a commodity that it is easy to make big profits from. Great teachers cost money. Capital and equipment costs are high. The length of time needed to produce high skilled workers is considerable. So one must ask, why are we seeing this Liberal government head down the path of Victoria? A state whose own Auditor General recently said that many TAFE institutes that were financially unviable, cutting courses, massively increasing fees and handing out contracts on the premises that the private sector will all of a sudden do it better. Council. John Robertson and Labor believe in TAFE. I believe in TAFE. And the, com <laughs> and the community I represent, the women and men from the electorate of Kira, who gave me the privilege to be their member, need a high quality TAFE system for them. That's why over the last 11 months I've visited TAFE campuses across this state. I've met Phil Chadwick more times than my wife over the last few months. <laughs> every, time I, every time I turn up to a TAFE, there is Phil getting his 15th disciplinary action. I've probably caused 14 out of 15 of them. <laughs> Over the last 11 months, I've visited these TAFE campuses, listening to the concerns of teachers, hearing the stories of students, and meeting union members like you to get a feel of just how desperate this issue is. And the issue is desperate. I want to briefly talk to you about a story I met from a gentleman in Bathurst. His name was Michael. He was a teacher. He told me not his concerns as much about him as a teacher, but that his son, had essentially been saved from a life of incarceration because of the opportunities that TAFE had given him. Him and his wife had spent years distraught, distressed about what would happen with their son. He was involved in drugs and heading down to a pretty difficult road. He said to me that if it wasn't for TAFE, he wouldn't know where his son would be at the moment. It's a story that resonated with me. There is nothing smart and there's nothing skilled about these reforms. Yeah. They will see the end of TAFE as we know it. And I've made it my personal commitment 
to do everything I can to stop this from occurring. <clears throat> this is a commitment I make to teachers, to students, parents and support staff for the very reason why our TAFE system is revered around the world. And it's a commitment I make to people like Michael. It's a commitment John Robertson and I are turning into action. Labor has committed to abolish smart and skilled if elected in March. <laughs> We've committed to freeze student fees to 2014 levels that will ensure students' bank balance does not determine their ability to access vocational education in New South Wales. Mm -hmm. The Council today, I make what I believe to be the most important commitment to preserve our TAFE system. TAFE will not survive if we don't put a cap on contestable funding. <laughs> so it gives me great pleasure to announce today that if a Robertson Labor government is elected in March, we will cap contestable funding. <laughs> no more, no more than 30% will ever be contestable under a Labor government that I'm a Minister for Education for or John Robertson is the leader for. <laughs> Compare this to the 70% that is contestable in Victoria and has decimated their TAFE system. This announcement will ensure there is a clear choice for voters as they enter the ballot box in a few months. It's the first time a government or an alternative government has made such a commitment in this country. If you value TAFE, and each of you do, and if you want TAFE to be t protected and enhanced, like you've told me, then Labor is our only choice to govern in New South Wales. And before my opponents start to run a campaign like they will, like I've heard the Minister yell across the chamber at me many a time in Macquarie Street, that we risk putting federal funding at risk if this announcement is made, well, let, you, let me tell you this directly from Chris Evans, when this issue was raised at the time of COAG agreement, and I quote, none of the $1.75 billion in funding the Commonwealth put on the table through the National Partnership Agreement to support and reward states and territories implementing the reforms is tied to contestability of public funding, mm. end quote. I wanted to do more than just announce the cap on fees. I knew that we were getting to a stage where someone had to stand up for TAFE. I knew that as in the years to come, I would have to look at my son in the eye and say to him, one way or another, that his dad had a chance to preserve TAFE, to give him, his mates, a second chance education if they needed it, and to give him and his mates an opportunity to the best tradespeople in the world. I wanted him to know when his dad had that opportunity, he took it. This is an announcement for every single kid, for every single young person, and for every single person who relies on TAFE. And it's also a person for every single community whose economy and the quality of life their communities enjoy is contributed heavily by the contribution their local TAFE make. Over the coming months, I encourage you to join John Robertson and I as we fight to save TAFE. <coughs> Council, let me be clear. Four more years under a coalition government and TAFE as we know it will be unrecognisable. And that's why we need your continued support. Today, we've laid down our plans for TAFE under a Labor government. Smart and skilled scrapped, fees frozen, and a cap on contestability. <laughs> 
Council, one of the cruelest blows that the New South Wales Co Coalition Government has delivered is on the working conditions of women and men who serve our community. They've destroyed the workers' compensation system. And having living, living with my wife, who's had to use that system, I know the extreme difficulty that people with long-term chronic injuries experience and the criticisms and sniping they have to get from people in the community as they manage their condition. They've destroyed it and they've cut medical coverage and compensation for lost income to victims of workplace injuries. John Robertson has made it clear that one of his first acts as Premier would be to scrap the changes made by the Coalition Government to this scheme, to restore journey claims to cover injured workers to and from work, and to reinstate protections for workers with total and permanent disabilities. <clears throat> but we intend on doing more than that. We're also committed to rebuild the independent umpire, that fantastic Industrial Relations Commission, so fair and reasonable claims can be heard and fairness can be restored. Labor understands that work demands of our teachers are changing. To be a teacher now is different even when I was a teacher. To be different when I was a teacher is a lot different to my, when my father's generation were classroom teachers. That's why by restoring a strong industrial relations commission, we will enable teachers and their representatives to run a work value case, making sure future negotiations are carried out in an informed way. that reflects the change challenges of modern day teaching. Council, at the beginning of this term of government, the co coalition announced what they call local schools, local decisions. The spin was simple. Principals, not back office bureaucrats, are the best managers of their school. At the same time, something very similar was happening, ironically, in the Department of Health, with local health boards. To the ill-informed, this policy may have sounded okay, why wouldn't a principal be the best person in charge? But the problem was it wasn't an education policy. It was a treasury policy. The government used this policy to decimate the department. Teachers, like I was, not back office bureaucrats who were in curriculum directorates, drug education units and other support centres were told to pack their bags. But don't worry, we were told, the principal can employ or not employ the services they need. Sure they can. It's not quite how it's worked in every other jurisdiction in this country or overseas in the research that I've carried out. But just like in the health system, this policy is making sure that the principal delivers the bad news, even though their hands are tied by budget allocation from Treasury. And let's be clear, as a local member of parliament, I'm in regular receipt of a letter from the Minister for Health that says something like this. That difficult issue that you raised, Mr Park, unfortunately is the responsibility of the local health board. Go and see them. Labor doesn't believe this is the way to go. We're committed to ensuring we have a staffing agreement in place that delivers on current class sizes, maintains a fair transfer system and ensures permanency employment for teachers. These are too important to lose. <clears throat> Council, it's important to remember that it was a Labor government who increased the number of teachers in New South Wales schools and delivered the K-2 class size reductions. We included protection of class sizes in the staffing agreement that was negotiated during our term in government. And today I'll give you another commitment. We will provide the same protection over the teaching staffing entitlements for schools. Yeah. The staffing formula that determines the number and type of teachers that schools are entitled to and based on enrolments, if I'm the Minister for Education, will be included in the staffing agreement. Yeah. Council, many teachers, parents and principals that I've spoken to raise a common issue and that is how do we best support our most vulnerable children? and those with special educational needs. I'm very aware that Federation has commissioned an important research project 
examining and evaluating current practices in the delivery of special education in our schools. And I give you a commitment today that I stand ready to work with Federation and other experts in this field about how we can improve the educational outcome for what is an ever increasing number of students in our classrooms. I've been fortunate enough as a local MP to work closely with people like Robin Christofides and her brilliant team that operate the behavioural school known as Flame Tree in the Illawarra and annex of Fig Tree High School. Just last, just last month, my local primary school had issues for students with special needs not getting the placements they needed. An issue, may I say, was resolved through the hard working of individuals such as Nicole Callanan from the Teachers' Federation in the Illawarra. I have a genuine commitment to work with Federation about how we can do more of what works and less of what doesn't when it comes to supporting students with special needs, their teachers and of course their parents. Council schools are now expected to deliver education using the latest technology in a way that engages and inspires our young people. But we also need to have the infrastructure to do it. Labor will always be a party that focuses on delivering high quality educational facilities. We know that no political party can ever say the job is complete when it comes to this issue because the demands are escalating. And to be blunt, the backlog from a maintenance perspective is increasing. We're committed to ensuring that schools get a fair go when it comes to the current cleaning arrangements that are in place. If elected, we would sit down with principals, the contractor, representative from the Federation to discuss what can be done to improve this issue. An issue that I've heard loud and clear is a concern to many teachers and principals in our schools. Council, thank you for giving me some time today to address you. On top of what I've outlined today, Labor has also already committed to 800 new teaching scholarships in maths and science. The last fortnight, I've committed to re-establishing the drug education unit a unit that should never have been abolished. Yeah. A unit that the Minister says was not needed. A unit that the Minister says has already been, work's already been delivered in schools from K to 12. Was a former health and physical education teacher, there is not a more sensitive topic and a more important topic. And to be delivered effectively, with the latest resources and the best support than drug education. It's sensitive, it's important. It needs to be taught well. It needs to be taught in an informed and contemporary manner. And these are not back office bureaucrats. They were some of the finest educators I've ever come across in that unit. They delivered world-class resources for every single school across this state. And be damned if I'm going to see that unit ripped up and abolished and not replaced if Labor is elected. We've, in, we've committed to increase the funding to support our community language schools. And we've also committed to hold a summit with teachers, child and adolescent health experts and researchers looking at how we can better manage classroom behaviour issues and better support teachers doing that as well as pre-service teachers in that area. <clears throat> And there'll be a lot more from me and John Robertson as we count down to what will be a very important election in March next year. I want to take this opportunity to thank each and every Federation member who have advocated and got in my ear with the tenacity and determination that demonstrates your passion for young people and the teachers and support staff who help shape their lives. I hope I've given you an insight today into what drives me every day as a policy maker to improve our schools, to improve our TAFEs, to make sure our young people have access to a great quality education, the same quality education I got at Dapto High School all those years ago. And to each of you I say this, thank you on behalf of John Robertson and the entire Labor team for your commitment, enthusiasm and dedication to society's most valuable asset, our people. Thank you.
We've, we've got about five minutes for questions. Uh, die buyers. It's clear that you understand the, the full benefits of the six years of Gonski, but the question I have for you in particular is between now and the next federal election, what will you and the state branch of your party do to convince the Abbott government to fund the fifth and sixth years of the Gonski for New South Wales students? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, correspondence not yet returned, unusually, uh, that I've written to uh, that federal education minister uh, down in Canberra. Um, I don't, the reason why I wrote to Adrian so early was, and yet to receive response, and somewhat frustrating to be honest, is because this could have easily been a bipartisan issue where we could have put some combined pressure and he could have put some combined pressure on Pine and Abbott to do something about it. I've made it clear to federal members of my own party that this is not going away, that I expect the pressure to be mounted in the, camp, in the federal parliament like I'm doing here. I will make sure that pressure is maintained at every opportunity I get. I want to be clear and concise as I was today that regardless of who sits on the benches in Canberra, my commitment to this is steadfast. I have spent considerable time reading the entire Gonski report. I did that because I wanted to invest the time to understand where the review was coming from and why it got to the point it was. It's clear the system was outdated. It was not a system that was working and it actually gave me great hope when those words about we're all on a unity ticket were uttered. Um, I've been disappointed that that happened and I will maintain the rage regardless of who occupies those benches in Canberra and I will continue to ask Adrian and I'll continue to ask Mike as I did the O'Farrell led government that there's an opportunity here to join across the floor and take this issue down to Canberra in a bipartisan way on behalf of young people in this state. And I was pretty annoyed at budget estimates when I asked some pretty specific questions to Adrian, or my committee asked it on behalf of me, about has it been raised at Ministerial Council? Has it been put back on the COAG agenda? And the answer was no. And I'm all for Adrian standing up and saying he believes in Gonski. He does. No problem in that. But politics at times is about getting your hands dirty. And my dad always said to me, it's not about warming a green leather seat. It's about doing stuff. And doing stuff sometimes means ruffling feathers. And there's an opportunity for him to ruffle feathers. He's the minister who's got the biggest education system in the country. And I want this back on COAC and I want this back at Ministerial Council meetings, and that's what I'll be pushing. Jeff Turnbull, TAFE Teachers Association and uh, Head Teacher at Ramwick TAFE College. Ryan, I want to thank you personally and congratulate you on your party's commitment to capping, to capping contestable funding in vocational education. I and my colleagues in TAFE, and of course our union, appreciate such a significant step in stopping the privatisation of our great TAFE system. Thank you. Now my question. From the Labor Party's perspective, what else can be done? What else will you do? For example, will you urge your federal Labor colleagues to adopt a similar policy in relation to the capping of contestable funding in vocational education? Well, I hope today's announcement leads the way towards that direction. I'll certainly be ensuring that uh, my colleagues in Canberra on both sides get a copy of this speech. Uh, we are the largest education jurisdiction. At times, we've got to lead the way. And this issue, to be blunt to you and to everyone here, should not have got to where it is today. 